All right, we wanna say welcome to everyone and we're glad that you could be with us. My name is Mark Lodato and I'm the Dean of the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications here at Syracuse University and welcome to this Orange Central event. It is not our typical uh, weekend in Orange Central here on campus, as you know, but that does not mean that we can't uh, celebrate all things Orange and talk about the wonderful things that are going on here at Syracuse and at the Newhouse School specifically. So. Uh, as a, the new dean here, I'm excited to have a little time with all of you, uh, answer your questions and have a really robust conversation today. And uh, we have a, one of our wonderful alums and uh, our board member, Marquise Francis, who is here with us today as well, who is going to uh, help lead this conversation. And uh, Marquise, I know that you are at Yahoo News doing great things, but maybe you could give everyone a little sense of your background and uh, and um, how you bleed orange as well. Welcome. Absolutely. Yes. Good afternoon, Dean. Thank you for that. Um, so like, like, as you mentioned, currently I'm a, a national reporter and producer at Yahoo News, um, and I really focus on covering the intersection between politics and culture. So obviously this year has been such a polarizing device, divisive year as have been, you know, recent politics. But um, from my perspective, I try to insert politics in a different way if I can talk to someone that is able to break things down to more layman's terms so that the majority of people can understand it and relate and hopefully engage with politics. That's really something I uh, seek to do. Um, but yeah, ba basically, since I graduated in 2013, I have figured tried to figure out ways in which I can continue to stay involved with Syracuse and especially with Newhouse School. So I am on the board of the Newhouse 44, which is an alumni group of um, Newhouse um, grads who just would like to engage and we have um, mentees who are both seniors as well as graduate students within the Newhouse program and since you came on board I've really just been intrigued to get to know you more and get involved with Newhouse more and you set up a lot of great programs at the start you know really hitting the ground running I was reading a, uh, a DO uh, article they did on you and Hub Brown said how you just really hit the ground running so really excited to have this conversation today and um you know, without further ado, I'd love to, to hop into things. I'm not sure if you wanted to say anything else. No, just quickly that, uh, again, we really appreciate your help and leadership here at the school. And I, I will say the the strength of the Newhouse Network and, and frankly, alumni engagement at Syracuse University has uh, been truly remarkable. And it's been one of the things that I expected to be good, but not this good when I got here. So uh, Marquise is a wonderful example of, of the kind of engagement we get. So um, definitely finding some time in a day to have these sorts of conversations, I think is terrific and, and really important as people get to know more about uh, the Newhouse School and Syracuse and and uh, and our, our years ahead. So yeah, Marquise, let's go ahead and, and jump into it whenever you're ready. Yeah, absolutely. So just to start off, I know, you know, usually weather is a cheap way to start off any conversation, but I think it's pretty stark. Uh, I looked up the weather this morning in Arizona right now, it's 69 degrees, but in Syracuse, it's 36. So how has that transition been? And obviously, I, I think this is your first Syracuse winter. So what are you expecting about, you know, and it's, it's, it's a pandemic. So, you know, with all that going on, what's your expectations going into this first Syracuse winter? Well, I, I guess my expectation is I would describe myself as cautiously optimistic, uh, <laughs> which is, you know, maybe a bit uh, premature on my part. Uh, you're right. It's going to be a big change for me and my family. And I'll be honest with you, there was a, there was a chance in the forecast last night that we were going to get snow overnight. So I was kind of excited. I, I <laughs> looked out the window this morning when the alarm went off, hoping to see a little a little snow, but there was nothing. So I'll have to wait. But I've I've been reassured that that time will come. So I don't need to yes. worry as if we whether or not we're going to get any snow. Uh, but um, yeah, I think it's it's really just sort of the flip of living in Arizona. You know, in Arizona, the winters were amazing and comfortable and spring was outstanding. And then summer was pretty dreary, right? It was 100 <laughs> plus degrees all the time. Uh, and here it's just just the other way around. And but honestly, I like winter sports. I love to ski uh, and do other things like that. So I'm I think I'm going to hold up okay. But my whole family, we're sort of starting from scratch when it comes to the right wardrobe, and uh, that's that's going to be paramount. The the most consistent advice I have received, and this is no joke, is to get a great pair of boots. That's what everybody tells me I need to do. Uh, so that is is the one thing I have accomplished. I would say, but we're 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 cautiously optimistic. 
<laughs> great, great. So we're definitely going to get into some questions so that, you know, folks viewing this get to know you a bit more. But I think one of the things top of mind right now is how is Newhouse and Syracuse University dealing with COVID-19, different restrictions that the schools and the students have? What's that been like on campus? Well, I, I would say I've been really pleased with the way everyone has uh, stepped up to do our very best to create a safe and engaging atmosphere. And, and I will tell you, you know, my start date was July 1 and realistically I was even engaged before that. And from that moment on, it, our heads were down and we're working hard and coming up with the best plans possible to create this situation. Uh, where students could be on campus, could be in the classroom most of the time uh, and engage and, and have a rich experience while also trying to create the safest environment possible, not just for our students, but also for our faculty and staff. And uh, I've been really pleased. The students are, they get it. They understand the challenge. And I think they saw early on in those first couple weeks that other schools were closing quickly uh, and really didn't have a handle on the situation. And, and I think many of our students said to themselves, I don't want that to be me. I don't want to go home. I don't want to study in the same bedroom that I went through high school in and, and those sorts of things. So they were pretty dedicated to the effort. Um, and while we've turned the corner towards the end of the semester, which is great, uh, it's, it's still dicey. We have Halloween, which is a, a big a social weekend. So I think a lot of us are a little nervous about how Halloween will go. But if we can, uh, I think, frankly, get through this weekend, um, I think we can make it to the end of the semester when everyone will depart after or right before Thanksgiving for several weeks. But um, again, I've been really pleased with the way the students have, have responded. We did a lot of creative things as best we could. We had tents outside of the new house building and doing outdoor classrooms while the weather held. Uh, and as you walk the halls, Marquise, there are students, but it's not that sort of close frenetic feeling that we get most years, right? We have literally less than 50% of the students in the building at any given time. So there is space and there are places to study. And what's, what I really love the most is seeing the students who may be taking one of their online classes, but they're in our building. They found a corner in food.com or the or the um, mower hallway or something like that, where they could sit, be quiet, put their headphones on and still engage, but still be part of that new house community and new house family. So, you know, knock on wood, we'll see what the next couple of weeks bring, but I think it's gone really, really well. And we've learned a lot though too, and we'll position even better for spring. Absolutely. And um, as Amanda put in the chat function, I'd love for folks who are watching to submit questions, comments, and I'll do my best to get to them. Um, just to read off one, Lori Shire, I believe her name is, uh, said, we're getting lots of snow in the Boston suburbs right now. So if you're looking for any snow, Dean, you can go over there. Um, also, Ryan Griffin, he suggests you get a, a good pair of Timberland boots. Uh, it was able to last until 91 and 95. He also attached a question. Um, what is one of your main goals in transforming Newhouse during these turbulent times? And how can news media get away from dividing our country by playing in niche audiences? So these are pretty much two different questions. But one of the things I will say before you get into that answer is I think this is what makes a Newhouse student so amazing, being able to pivot during times. I can remember my senior year, this is when Newhouse 3 was being built. So we, we actually had our studio in the classroom. But I think it was one of those things where you learn to roll with the punches, whether you're at a local news station or you're at somewhere big, things happen. COVID-19 for a lot of people came out of nowhere. So, yeah, just when you know, as you're navigating these challenges, what are some of the, you know, the biggest hiccups you foresee? And then switching over to that second part of the question. Yeah, I mean, I think you're you're absolutely right, Marquise, and great question, Ryan. The, the media landscape is changing so quickly that uh keeping up is a challenge, staying ahead is even more difficult. So I really tackle this at a lot of different levels. You know, first of all, uh, something Marquise just alluded to, I think adaptability to change needs to be in the DNA of every student that we graduate. And uh, that comes with the spirit of entrepreneurism and uh, the understanding that the workforce that I'm going into today is gonna be very different from five years or 10 years but I know since I went to the Newhouse School that I'll be able to handle that okay. We don't know what that's gonna look like. And it's not a hard skill necessarily, right? It's great to work across multiple platforms and those sorts of things. But I think it's more about 
frankly, attitude of adaptability that is key. So I wanna make sure that our students embrace the change, see that as a positive and not something that needs to scare them in the future. Um, but I do think there are, some, there are more tactical things we can be doing as well. I want to elevate our level of relationships with commercial companies, media outlets, clients, those sorts of things, uh, really to um, ensure that um, the employers of the future know that Newhouse students are ably prepared to enter the workforce right away and are ready to work across multiple platforms. And so in a way, I want to, frankly, increase what is already an amazing brand. I want to make it even stronger. And there are ways that we can do that through partnerships where more people are exposed to the kinds of work our students are doing. Um, and I think that will help us position. And we need to invest in research. It's not as sexy sometimes. There's a great new partnership with NBC or a top ad agency or Yahoo or something like that. But if we want to be the go-to resource for finding answers and anticipating that change, then we also need to be investing in our faculty and in the research capability, the sorts of things we do. That way, in the future, companies and foundations and others will turn around and come to us and help us find the answers and collaborate with us on solutions to that changing landscape. So a lot of pieces to that puzzle about making sure that we're prepared and ahead of the curve. And um, as regards to the you know, media getting away with dividing our country, I mean, you know, I think there, the reality is there's so much of a need for content in so many different directions today that we want our students to, to look at the wide landscape and, and see what we can do. Um, I do think that we have an obligation to do what we can to educate both the public and our students as to um, identifying the news, the sources of news, where are we getting the information that we're accepting as journalism today? And I want our students to understand that they have a responsibility in that and being transparent in their reporting and their efforts, but also that the um, public has resources at their disposal to be able to understand, is this really news or is this fake news? Or is, you know, where's this information coming from and give them the tools they need to decipher that. So um, that's going to be a, a uh, an evolving process, I think, for not just for Newhouse, but also for the whole journalism community. Very well said. And I know uh, previously at ASU, you were in charge of both recruitment and a, a doubly as important part, retention, which is obviously keeping the students there and happy. So obviously, once again, recruitment in the age of COVID has kind of flipped things on its head. But what are you doing to reach out and to continue getting the quality Newhouse students in you know, what about the financial aspect of it? You know, the challenges, because, you know, at the end of the day, there's a bottom line. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult. I think um, it's forcing us in a good way, I think, to be more creative in our outreach to prospective students first. Uh, uh, as we all probably can remember back to our own college search process, most of us got the chance to come on campus and look around. And that was a big deal, right? You could, you could get a sense not only of the physical campus, but also of the sort of the culture of the place and, and the school and everything else. And we simply can't do that to the same level today. So we're working very hard to create ways for prospective students to engage remotely. So whether that's doing a rem literally live remote tour with one of our student ambassadors, or whether it's watching a whole new slate of videos that we're producing, um, or outreach events via Zoom and whatnot, both location-based and and everything else. We're trying to be very aggressive in this space. And I think that's important. And, and we've added staff members and, and I've sort of redesigned our recruitment and engagement team uh, to be more aggressive in this, in this role this year than we've had to in the past. And you know, Newhouse has always had a great reputation. So we've sort of said, come on in, we'll show you around and, and you'll be all in. And, and frankly, I don't think we can be that passive anymore. I think we need to be aggressive and I would have said that a year ago anyway, I think the journalism and communications uh, disciplines are more competitive today. So I wanted to up our outreach already. And then you put COVID on top of that, Marquise, and we have to be uh, even more creative and aggressive. So I think, I think we're doing well. And we've got some nice things in the pipeline that seem to be working. I think part of that is having more conversations with parents. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's traditional as an educator, and then we work with students to sort of frankly separate from parents, right? You want to sort of forge your own path. 
Uh, and while that's still the case, I think when it comes down to, to deciding where to go to school, I think parents are playing an even more pivotal role today than they did at, in the past. So I'm trying to have more conversations with parents. I want them to know that as the dean that I am highly invested in their students' success and their health uh, and their ability to have a, a unique and enriching campus experience, even though it might be different. So I'm trying to carve out more time in my schedule to uh, answer those kinds of questions and have these sorts of sessions with parents as well. Um, and then to your point about retention, uh, yeah, college is tough and COVID is tough and families may have uh, experienced a, a, a traumatic event that they didn't expect in the last year or two. And it may be financial, it may be health related, and we want to be um, helpful. We want to be a resource and we want to be open. So uh, we have frankly set aside a few more dollars for emergency support for students. Um, and we've uh, launched a new scholarship campaign to help students um, who may be fit, finding more uh, uh, economic challenge than they have in the past and may not have anticipated sort of finish line scholarships for students who uh, need to be able to stay in school uh, as juniors or seniors. So we're trying to be aggressive and, and take on um, uh, new approaches. But I think it's also important to share that with our alumni community and, and not to make this the focus of our conversation, but we could use help. I mean, there's always opportunities and ways for people to engage, whether that's helping with internships or um, you know, donations to emergency funds for students and those sorts of things. So uh, we're, we're trying to keep it moving and keep creative, but it's, it, it is no doubt a challenge here every day. Yeah, I think that's super important. And I know a lot of, a lot of men often say, um, happy wife, happy life. And I think when you're dean of a, a college, it's happy parent, happy life. So I think it's super important to make sure the parents are always engaged and just you know, happy with the way things are going. Um, and, and then just speaking to, I'm going to get to some, some more questions in a bit, but in speaking to the student success, I know in a previous conversation we had, you talked about thinking about the whole student. So what, what does that mean to you when you're thinking about the individual challenges, but obviously you're governing, you know, managing everyone. So what, what does the whole student uh, mean to you? Well, I think that's a, that's, I would say an, an approach that's really evolved in the last five to 10 years. And and I think there was a time when higher education was the ivory tower, right? And, and you made your way to the class and you were lectured at uh, for hours on end and, and off to do your studies. And that was sort of the relationship between the school and the students. And that's simply not a recipe for success anymore. I think it's critically important that leadership of a school and of a university understand that the student's life today is amazingly complicated. So you've got the financial piece, but you also have the social piece and you've got, there's a mental health capacity too. And, and so it's really important to me and I've done my best in my short time here to stress to, to my leadership team that we need to take a broad a a view of what we describe as student success. So of course there's career counseling and that sort of thing. There's traditional advising, but there's non-traditional advising too. And, and helping students find the kinds of resources that they need, whether that's mental health, whether that's financial, whatever that is, and, and know that we all can be proponents of that. And we also all can have our eyes out for students who are in distress. You know, it may, it's probably gonna be a teacher who is the first one to notice, wow, Marquise really isn't himself right now. What's going on? You know, he's had a, it's, it's post Thanksgiving and he went home, but now he's back and, but he doesn't seem himself. You know, maybe he's homesick, maybe it's something else. Maybe he learned that, you know, his, his brother lost his job or something like that. And, and I'm asking our faculty and others to, to not just let that slide, but to ask, you know, Marquise, how's everything going? Is there anything we can do? And, and then also frankly report that to the Dean's office. And, and so we can put the pieces together. Then I would probably reach out to your other instructors and say, Hey, is, has Marquis seen himself as, you know, is he being himself or does he seem a little, a, a little off, a little sad, maybe grades are dipping a little bit. What can we do? And then you want to help those students find those sorts of resources. So really trying to, to take everything in mind as we help students succeed. And right now during COVID, I think that means, coming up with ways for students to stay engaged, um, even remotely. Uh, so we're trying to be creative in that regard. I think, especially at the beginning of the year, students were, felt a little pent up and 
and isolated and, and that's no fun. That's not why we come to college. So uh, we have to work even harder and we're, and we're trying to do that for sure. Yeah. I mean, I have to give kudos to every student on campus right now because I could not imagine being in school and having such guidelines, you know, especially being in cold weather and kind of having to stay in a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Lottie Watts, class of 09, just wanted to say thank you, Dean, uh, for continuing to prepare and support the students. She's grateful for everything she's learned. Even though she doesn't work in news anymore, uh, she's grateful for her broadcast skills that she uses each and every day. I wanted to note that. And I believe this is a parent, Margie Goldblatt. Um, she said, are there any classes being offered live for Newhouse students right now? My daughter, who's a junior, it says RFT major, she may have met TRF major, does not have any. Also, she's interested in some of the Newhouse internship programs in London and or LA. Any updates on these programs and what is happening to them? Sure, Margie, uh, both really good questions. Yes, we actually have more than 78% of our new house school courses have an in-person component. So I'm sorry if she's a TRF major right now and, and somehow uh, the way the chips fell, she didn't, does not have any in-person classes. I'm, 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 I'm sorry to hear that. It's a little late in the semester to add one, but we can certainly take a close look for spring and make sure that, that we get her back in the building uh, because even in the studios and that sort of thing, we are doing work. So that will be something she'll want to take a look at. Um, one thing we did learn this fall that we're trying to do a better job in spring is when registration opens here in a couple of weeks, it should be very clear which classes are going to be meeting in person versus online or versus hybrid, the combination. So she should have a, a more specific choice scenario for her when it comes time to register and she can make sure that she's signing up for the right um, sections. Um, Regarding external um, opportunities, um, London is going to be very difficult. In other words, abroad programs, while we haven't officially said we're not going to engage in abroad programs in the spring, just being a realist and looking where Europe is right now with testing um, and everything else and case counts, I think it's highly unlikely that we'll be able to offer abroad programs in the spring. Um, but New York and Los Angeles, that's a little bit different. We actually um, programmed both remotely this um, this fall, and it worked really, really well. We actually had uh, record numbers engaging, and it allowed us to create experiences in a different way that helped us reach people who we hadn't even brought into the classroom before at high levels all around the world. So I'm really encouraged by our um, Los Angeles and New York programs. If, if, um, if the decision were being made today, Los Angeles would likely still remain remote. So you can be here in Syracuse and be a part of our SULA program, which is amazing and have a great experience. And I can, I can put you in touch with the director out there who can put you in touch with students and explain what that's been like. Uh, they've been doing info sessions and that sort of thing. And New York, actually, I think it is uh, very possible that we'll be able to um, to actually program an in-person experience in New York City this spring. So I'm cautiously optimistic about that and we're positioning to do that. But either way, there will be both online and uh, even if we're in person, there will be online experiences there as well. So students really can get engaged either way. And um, uh, I'll, I will tease one new class uh, for spring in New York City. We actually, Marquise is developing uh, together with our director there in New York and, and me, uh, a new class that will help students um, with digital storytelling up their skills. It's a hands-on experience. And, and Marquise, I know if we, if we play our cards right and our students get it all done, we, we hope to have some of these stories engaged on, on Yahoo News platforms also, which would be terrific. Exactly. Yes. No, thank you for that. And thank you for even just working with me. And I was even looking at uh, reading a little bit more about you. And I saw you read a book about storytelling. I said, oh, I think I need to buy that. Um, I saw it was in 30 other universities. So you, you kind of holding, holding, holding back there. But um, that was great to see. Well, we're, we're actually working on the second edition now, which is going so slowly. So, uh, <laughs> we're, you know, like um, it's a group of co-authors. There's four of us and we're, we're all at different universities and we're all just mm. sort of trying to make it through the semester. So finding time to update the book has been tough, but we'll get you a copy. Great. Um, and another question from JP Goldman. If you have opportunities to counsel incoming students at Newhouse, 
What other fields, for instance, the sciences, public health, economics, and the liberal arts question? Mm -hmm. And are you inclined to suggest that students consider studying that will benefit them when it's time to job hunt? And what percentage of the new house majors currently double major in another field? Oh, I wish I knew the percentage, JP. That's that's a good question. Um, those are the kind of stats I just don't have on immediate uh, recoil yet, just because I've only been here a few months. But I know a, a significant number, hundreds of our students are dual majors, and we offer some very strong uh, dual major experiences with other uh, colleges like uh, Maxwell and Whitman and others. So I think it's for the right student, it's a great way to go, but it's certainly not required for finding a successful path. Obviously, we have lots of students who are expected to minor as well. So that's another way to get um, a sort of a niche skill set. Um, along with the major. Uh, for me, I look for areas when I'm talking about uh, other things to, to study besides the communication speech piece. I think economics is fantastic. I think a business expertise can always be valuable and public health are, are two really good ones. I think those are areas where there's opportunity both within communications. So uh, financial reporting uh, or public health reporting and communication spaces, public relations, and, and those sorts of things are hugely valuable. Or uh, there are companies looking for expertise in those areas, absolutely. Public relations and finance, I think, would be a great combination, or journalism and finance or public health. Um, but then also, those are skill sets you can take outside of communications if you want. That's why. I'm such a proponent, not just because I'm a dean of a communication school, but uh, just in general, a proponent of communications as a major, because that is a skill that you can transfer in so many different directions. You're, you're getting top-notch skills in communication, um, analytical skills, uh, and writing skills, presentation skills, and, and you can take that in so many different directions, whether that's law or policy and, and um, you know, nonprofit work. Is so many different things and obviously a, a, an array of graduate degrees. So um, that that is the kind of thing that I would counsel students on approaching. Uh, it's have a varied uh, experience here on campus. And but in terms of a, a minor or double major, I would really probably go the business or health route, ideally. Yeah, I can remember a lot of students having a double major with the business school. Um, so something I want to uh, pivot a bit to and we talked about it with uh, you know, having to think about the whole student, but um, an emphasis more so on, you know, a more inclusive uh, and diverse new house. And I know that's been, once again, another point of emphasis for you. Um, but obviously, just even to get a bit personal, I can remember being in new house and, um, you know, I was the only black student in a lot of my classes. And, you know, and I think that, once again, it, it sets you up for maybe a lot of the experiences you may have in corporate America. But I think, you know, as we continue to grow as, as a new house family, I think it's one area that we can push ourselves with. So I'm just curious, and I know you started programs, and maybe you can just speak to some of the things that you're looking to do to continue to grow. So maybe, you know, a student doesn't have the experience of being the only one or the, the faculty, you know, the, those numbers growing as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's, it's obviously hugely important um, for our school and I think for our society also that we take responsibility for uh, diversifying our classrooms and experiences as well as our faculty and staff. And, and you're right. I mean, that's been a, uh, an important part of my platform, so to speak, upon my arrival here. And it, and it needs to be. I mean, you know, to be perfectly honest, right? The previous dean was an African American woman, and and we hire a white male to for the next chapter. Uh, not only is it important to me personally, but I think I need to show the new house community that uh, I'm not just going to be a proponent. I'm going to be a strong advocate and make decisions with this in mind to continue to diversify our school. And that's where it needs to go. I mean, you're right. The numbers, frankly, aren't where they need to be. Whether that's uh, diversity in our student population or faculty or staff, but it's not just the numbers, right, Marquise? It's also that sense of inclusivity and 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 comfort level in the building. Like you want to look around and say, look, there are people like me here. That's part of the reason why I came to this school. And, and so I need to push in a lot of different directions to achieve those sorts of goals. So I'm really, I'm looking at it at all levels. Um, as you know, I've created some committees that involve our alumni to help me 
really a see what is going on outside of our building and and look for some best practices and then b help me devise a, a true strategy so then we can define the goals to reach that strategy i think uh, the new house school is pushing aggressively in this area on a lot of different fronts but i think our strategy needs um, further to be further defined so that we can have these measurable goals and know how we're doing so that um, that is a key piece and and I am a huge proponent, and part of this is ingrained for me from where I came, and which was Arizona State University. And that is a school that very proudly states, you know, we are measured by whom we include, not whom we exclude. And uh, I bring a bit of that theory here to the Newhouse School, and that we have thousands of amazing applicants from all across the country who are excellent in, in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And so knowing that there's a, a a wide array of students we can bring in. Now it's up to me to help break down those barriers to access to the new house school. And, and unfortunately for many people, that's finances. So one of the things that I announced just a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was just last week, is this new scholarship program. And we're devoting literally millions of dollars over the next few years to aid students to reach the new house school. It's students who are facing financial difficulty, but still have outstanding academic track record. And those are the kinds of students uh, that I think, um, while not exclusively for uh, diverse students, certainly will include some diverse students. And it just in general, that helps uh, increase our student base, um, which is hugely important. And I think from the faculty and staff perspective, we need to look at um, diversity in, at every hire we make and say, uh, uh, have we reached the right group of people to advertise this job? And, and are we ensuring that uh, we have a diverse group of finalists? And, and if not, then we need to work harder. That's the bottom line. I literally kicked back a job last week. It was for a research faculty position, very niche position. It's, a, it's, it's unique. Wouldn't get a lot of applicants, I think in a normal circumstance, we only got seven applicants. I'm like, that's just not good enough. We got to do better. And uh, you know what? We don't need the position tomorrow, right? We need the right person. And so let's kick it back. Let's look at how we approach this and let's try again. And I have no problem doing that because, you know, we're setting up the new house school for years to come. And so we need to do that with very thoughtful, uh, purposeful action. And um, so it's going to take time, but I think we're, we're going in the right direction with help of, with, with others in the building and outside and, other areas of the new house community, I think we can get there. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, and I have to give you some credit. I know when you introduced yourself to the new house 44, you know, you talked about some of the challenges. And one of the questions I asked is not only the optics, but the reality of having Dean Branham, a black woman who, you know, very much went out of her way in, in a lot of ways to help marginalized groups. And how are you tackling that? And you you, you laid out what you wanted to do and you offered up your phone number and I actually texted you and said, hey, let's let's get on. We can look at some things and I appreciate you actually engaging and actually taking these things seriously. So, um, you know, it's it's just comforting that it's not all talk, which oftentimes sometimes you can be just speak um, for a lot of people. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see what's to come for sure. Yeah. And and, you know, you, you and others need to hold me accountable. Right. And and uh that's fine. I, the one thing I will also always admit is I don't have all the answers, right? And so I think my job as a dean and one who really subscribes to servant leadership, it's it's re removing barriers for others to succeed. And that's also barriers for staff to succeed too. So that's me saying, look, I don't have all the answers. Come work with me, help me figure this out and we'll do this together. And that's really my approach um, because I think for me to sort of come in here and simply assume that I know how to fix this sort of complicated challenge would be hugely presumptuous. Uh, and so it's it's really important to me that people know that they can, they can reach out to me, they can offer up ideas. And uh, I, I love to have those sort of collaborative conversations. And frankly, it got a lot easier for me uh, when I admitted to myself that I'm not, I'm never gonna have all the answers, right? And, and I think weirdly leaders sort of put this on themselves that, that uh, somehow you're supposed to sort of know it all. And uh, your job gets a lot easier when you admit that you don't, and then it's okay to ask for help. Um, and so that's that's really my theory coming in here. Thank you for that. And just want a reminder to everyone watching, uh, please submit your questions, comment. I'll definitely do my best to get to them. Um, so next we have a question from Ryan Griffin. 
He says, I agree that being a dual major was key to my continued success. I used my broadcast journalism major for 13 years in TV news, as well as my Maxwell political science degree. I taught for 12 years after that and now work in public service for the state of Ohio in the governor's communications department. Literally, I owe that first job to Syracuse and all the dominoes that fell after Syracuse. Keep promoting the dual majors. Yeah, well, that's that's a great point, Ryan. And, and congratulations to you. And I I think your career path is, is, a, is truly a, a great example of that skill set that we provide that can lead you in so many different directions. And I'll tell you, yeah, I graduated with a journalism degree myself from a, a different institution, uh, but you know, it's a, it was a great experience. But I didn't know thirty years ago I would be the dean of a of a journalism school. I went out to be a reporter. You know, I mean, that's and that's what I did for 15, 16 years. So I think you never know, sort of, obviously, where life will take you and the challenges that you want to to take on. And and I think that's really reassuring when you know that you have a a base of, of skills and experiences and frankly, a network to call upon for help uh, as things change over five, 10, 15, 20 years. And, and I think that's really part of what makes Newhouse so special. That's great. So uh, another question I think, and we, once again, we touched upon it a bit, but I think oftentimes as even Newhouse students, we're always thinking ahead, you know, especially as alumni, you know, we're always thinking what is happening on the ground that makes us happy. So I'm just curious, from where we're at right now in the school, what are some real lofty goals that you have in the next five or plus years for the school? Um, it, it makes me chuckle a little bit because when I was offered the job, so this was back in you know February and it was announced in March, and you know COVID was definitely on the radar, but it wasn't to the to the point where we are now, and. Uh, man, all these lofty goals, Marquise. I mean, it was just, you know, <laughs> oh, the sky is the limit. We're going to do this yeah. and this and this. And and then it was sort of like, I just want to open the doors in the in the fall, right? Everything just became, what is what is it going to take to safely get students back on campus and, and start the semester? So in some weird ways, that really helped me refine. But the good news is we've had a fair amount of success uh, to date. Um, and so I've been able to take a step back and, and re-identify with some of the, those goals. And I think, you know, what I would really like to see theoretically is, is for the Newhouse School to grow to be a true thought leader in some of these areas that are so challenging uh, for us in the communication space today. So, you know, take, the, take, for example, you know, my area of expertise, journalism, right? Well, I don't have to tell anybody watching today that journalism has been under attack and at the same time, I think people understand, most people understand the value of a free press and that it's an important piece of our democracy. I mean, it really is. And so there's a disconnect there, right? If we're not doing our job at a, in a space that is truly core to the democracy of our country. So I think the Newhouse School needs to be a leader in both figuring out what's the problem and then what, do we, what is the solution and what do we need to be doing in the future? And and that's an area that I really want to see us tackle. And so one of the positions we'll be um, advertising for here shortly for new faculty members, someone who's going to look at that intersection of bias and how it impacts an individual and then in turn impacts their world, their job, uh, and what do we need to be doing to, to address that. So, you know, journalism, when I went through J school 30 years ago, it was, Mark, you're not biased. And when you report a story, you, you know, you put anything out, out of the, out of the mind and just go straight down the middle. And yeah, you know, I did my very best at that for 15 years, but I'm a little more enlightened today. And I know that, you know, growing up in the suburbs, the, the rather affluent suburbs of San Francisco, California, that's whether I wanted to or not somewhere that's going to help shape how I cover a story. Right. And and so today I want to give our students and our reporters the ability to be able to manage that, knowing from whatever direction we come from, we need to know the world in which we've grown up, where we've experienced and, and be able to look at that in the ways and factor that into how we're approaching the story. Does that mean we need to talk to more sources? Does that need to be mean? Does that mean we need to be transparent to the audiences about you know, who we are and where we come from. And, and so they can decide if that impacted the way I wrote a story or covered a story. I mean, there's just, it's a fascinating approach to look at. And that's just journalism, you know, 
you know, who knows when we get into areas of communication and, and political communication and those sorts of things where these issues come up. So that's a space I want to be aggressive in. And we're, I think you will see in the years ahead some more investment in a Washington, D.C. presence for both Newhouse and Syracuse University. And I think we can do that in collaboration. Um, that will help us take a leading role, I think, and, and position ourselves as, as a thought leader in this space. Um, I think there's more of a hands-on experiences we can be providing our students in Los Angeles and New York and other locations. I think our sports curriculum uh, can continue to grow and, and we can provide some definition and framework to that. So we're not losing prospective students to some other universities and warmer climates uh, who get to cover professional sports. I think I can, I think I can compete at that level. So there's a lot on my drawing board that I'm looking forward to tackling in the years ahead. That's a great framework. And I can I can just picture I think I've seen it definitely a few times, but just the Syracuse background a bit on <clears throat> a bit more on cable news and, you know, a lot of these sports shows. I think I think that would be really powerful and obviously a branding. Um, but I, I was struck when you mentioned um, you growing up and it kind of reminded me I would love to hear and, and also for the people watching just to hear more about, you know, how you got to this point. You know, who who is Mark, you know, uh, through you know, childhood, college, and leading up to Syracuse University, what is, what has that path been like? Well, it's, I, I, it's a pretty unique, well, I don't know if it's truly unique. It's unique for me, obviously. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I got into communication because our high school, this is long before the internet, our high school had a little 100-watt radio station. I thought that was the coolest thing. And so <laughs> I walked in one day and basically signed up to be a DJ. And I quickly learned I was a horrible DJ. Like, I just panicked, you know, what, what am I, I'm not ready for the next song and all these things. So I found my way into sports and news and just loved it and continued on this path to, to being a, a news reporter. And that's what I did for 15 years. I worked in Washington, DC and in Florida and Arizona, and it was fantastic. But what I didn't really realize was happening along the way is, you know, I grew up in the shadow of Stanford University. My father was highly involved at Stanford and even on the board of trustees there and athletic board and whatnot. And so I think I was really getting this appreciation for higher education was sinking in. And I didn't really realize it at the time. But sooner or later, I was just drawn back into the, into the classroom and I would teach on the side while I was reporting. And then ultimately, 15, 16 years into my career, there was an opportunity to, to flip it. And and to join the faculty, actually, at the University of Maryland was my first full-time job in, in academia. And I just loved it. And I continued on that path ever since. And uh, that led me to ASU and then ultimately here to Syracuse. And, you know, this was an opportunity that I simply couldn't pass up because it was just such a strong institution. But I also thought the kinds of things that I was doing at ASU were a really good match for Syracuse. And and together we could do some really great things. And I'm, I'm excited to see what we'll accomplish in the, in the years ahead. Thank you for that. And Sheila Payton, uh, class of, looks like 1970, um, Newhouse and Maxwell, this is just a comment, but she said, you most likely know this, but just uh, so you're aware, National Association of Black Journalists and National Association of Hispanic Journalists are great resources for recruiting diverse students. And I know, um, you know, when I was there, I know we had an NABJ undergraduate chapter, and I believe we had an NAH, NAHJ undergraduate chapter, and I know uh, we have personnel who attend those uh, conferences as well. Yeah, we, we are definitely engaged with those groups, um, and but I think we can both grow their presence here on campus, but as you mentioned, for recruitment, especially graduate students, those are great resources, but even at the undergraduate level, that high school engagement, Frankly, I don't think Newhouse has done a ton in, in, in recent years there. And that's an area where I want to be more uh, engaged also. I think uh, both to create a more diverse uh, student body, but also frankly, to give back. I think I, I have a sense of social embeddedness when it comes to higher education. I think we need to, to do our part in, in high school, support of high school communications and journalism is a place where we, I think we could have some success. So we'll definitely be doing that kind of outreach, Sheila, for sure. Great. So we're coming up on the last minute. So I just wanted to ask you just a couple quick questions, just kind of like one word, two word answers, just to get to know you a bit more. Um, so what's the a Dean's favorite food? Uh, favorite food for me, I I'm Italian. So I always sort of default to, to great spaghetti or pizza, those sorts of things. Uh, but after Arizona many years, it was a, 
I, I the, the whole taco thing slipped in. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I have to go with Italian Marquis. Okay. Okay. So some varsity runs in the near future. Yes. Um, what about your favorite college sport? Oh, football. It's got to be football. I just, I, I was actually, fun fact, for Stanford University, I was um, on the field. I was a ball boy with a team of team of people, boys and girls, for Stanford football when John Elway was the quarterback. So I got to watch him like feet away, and it was an amazing experience. So I've college football has to be it for me. But I'll I'll go to basically any event. So I'm, I'm I love cheering on college athletics in general and our students. Yes. Athletes. And the Syracuse football team definitely can use your support. Yes. Uh, how about your uh, favorite author? Oh my gosh, that's that's harder. Uh, this probably isn't terribly deep, but I loved uh, Tom Clancy growing up, and and John Grisham, and it's sort of the you know, the military Jack Ryan stuff, and and um, the Grisham you know, crime, and and those sorts of things. So that's sort of a default. I'm, but I'll, I'll have to think about that one a little bit harder and come on up with someone someone a little more cerebral for you. <laughs> All right. And then your favorite music artist. Oh, I, I don't know. I guess I would say Dave Matthews band, uh, Springsteen, U2. That's sort of, sort of, sort of my generation. I would say that that's where I'll go. And and Beatles, of course, are always there. Okay, great. And then I, we're, we're just that time, but I did want to end off with, and this this fits perfectly, fits perfectly because the last question from Kristen Rossetti is how can we get more involved as new house alums uh, and she's a 95 BDJ um, graduate and lastly this is kind of your opportunity your call to charge to those uh, you know watching listening and you know how can people get more active yeah absolutely and Kristen thanks for reaching out uh, you know first of all I would say connect with our career development center we'd love uh, positioning recent graduates as mentors uh, is a great way to get involved um, and also keep in touch for, you know, student panels and, and those sorts of things. Um, our alumni engagement office, Amanda Griffin, I know would love to connect with you uh, and talk about other ways in which uh, you can connect with us. Um, and it, and let, me, let me make it clear, it doesn't have to be financial, right? There's a lot of ways to stay strong and, and connected with Newhouse and our students uh, cherish the time that they get to spend with our alums. So we would love to connect with you and stay engaged. And, and to your point, Marquise, I'll say that to everyone watching today. I think you know, there's a lot of ways to stay connected to your alma mater and, and provide support. So we'll be reaching out and connecting with you and, and help you find the right way to, to stay connected and, and know that um, non-COVID times, our door is always open. You know, the, I'm in Newhouse One and would love to meet you. Um, and in the meantime, I'm happy to set up a Zoom uh, or a call or something just to talk about what's going on here at school and, and hear more about what you're doing and, and find ways uh, for you to connect. So I'm, I appreciate this time to get to say hello to everyone and, and really look forward to getting to see people personally in the years ahead. Thank you for that. And Amanda did put a link that uh, ways in which alumni can stay involved. And I also have to note, I see those Emmys over your shoulder. So uh, they look beautiful. Um, but yes, thank you this afternoon for just taking the time to, to speak to us. Hopefully alumni got to know you a bit better. And we're really looking forward uh, to the years ahead, new house, you know, COVID times and post COVID. So thank you so much for being so transparent. All right. My pleasure, Marquise. And thanks for helping us out today. It's great to see you again. Likewise.